Welcome to The Downside. My name is Jamarco Cerezi. I am here with guest co-host and uh, a favorite past guest, mm. Joyelle Nicole Johnson. Welcome. Hello, John Marco. How you doing, boo? Thank you for being here. I love, I love, well, you can't see your earrings now. Well, Did I you took take them, them off for the headphones? I took them off for the headphones, yes. I was wearing my um, Alabama brawl, uh, ha, hashtag ha. never forgets, because, um, you know, sometimes violence is the answer. Mm. Mm. Did you, you didn't have those, you got those right after? Like, did you see it and immediately you made the connection, oh, you gotta get earrings? I, it was a birthday gift. Mm. My birthday just passed and one of my friends knows me very well. Shout uh -huh. out to Tyron uh -huh. Thornhill. <laughs> what ended up happening at the end of that? Did I, did, did anyone get arrested? Oh, did, I think the white people on the yacht yeah, went yeah, to yeah. jail. I think. They got they arrested. Probably, yeah, yeah, I think they went to jail for like two and a half seconds and bailed themselves out and, you know, they're back on their yacht. But they were in control. Sure. And that's the only thing you could ask to happen to rich white people. I saw the recreations of it. It was so uh, funny. Oh, that whole day on Twitter was one of my favorite days on Twitter. What do you mean? I feel like ballet would make a comeback. That's what they need to do. Imagine if the Met Ballet mm -hmm. said we're going to recreate that in a ballet scene. Oh, yeah, yeah. That that's would be a good idea. Fuck the Nutcracker. No one yeah. wants to see the fucking Nutcracker anymore. Yeah, yeah. I want to see Misty Copeland smash somebody on the head with, That's great. That'd be fun. with a folding chair. If you're listening to Matt, please take that. Can you just make sure this camera's recording? Is the red light on there? Ooh, is Sorry there about a red that. Light? I, my, I don't my see own. a red light. You don't see a red light? Uh oh. Where, no uh -oh. way. Uh -oh. On top of that sorry. screen? Oh, the red light over here? It's a dot. Sorry, I didn't specify uh, where the red light would be, but you thank sure you. You sure enough didn't. Like that, like, like that one. Like that one. There you go. Yes. There's one like that over there. It is. All right. Let me introduce our guest. I know. He, uh, 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 he performs all over, not just the country, truly the world. The world. A true, a true international. I go into London in November. I tell everyone I'm an international comedian. Yes. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. I went to Canada last week. I'm uh, international. Uh, uh, Maz, Maz Jobrani. Yes. Did I say that correctly? Maz Jobrani. Maz Jobrani. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, uh, welcome to The Downside. This is a place... Where we can complain, we can be negative. We don't have to say what we're thankful for, or what's nice, or you know, well, at least we have our health. Fuck that shit. We're here to we're here to talk. Let's we're talk uh, about uh, it. and and we've never met. It was very nice yeah. of you to do this. Thank you. Nice of you to have me. I appreciate it. Especially I, uh, you just landed. You said so for you to come yeah, here. Yeah, you know, I live in L.A. and so I don't get. I haven't gotten to the East Coast in a little bit, and I'm doing shows in Philly, so I timed it out so that I could come here. Do this, do a set tonight in town. And, Where are you uh, going in town? going to go do the cellar. Yeah. I have the cellar tonight, too. Beautiful. Then we'll do that. And then, and I was going to go to the stand, but I guess I got in touch too, la too late. So one is enough, and I'll see a friend. I'll hang out. And it's beautiful. The weather's nice in New York. I love walking around. Every time I come to New York, I get cocky, and I walk everywhere the first day, and then I'm sore the rest yeah. of my stay. <laughs> then your uh -huh. knees are vibrating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is, it is that beautiful fall, and it'll go away so soon. Yeah. I, I was in Iowa last weekend and it was awful, but uh, cold. Yeah, didn't pack for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you ever you ever go somewhere you don't you truly don't have a jacket and you're like, well, how do I go? I am a and black there's no Ubers. woman. I always have a jacket. I will bring a jacket. Is that a if thing? Well, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Like if I'm ever cold, if I see a black woman, I can go. It's, it's, you have me. a jacket. I know. For me? Yeah. I know you have a jacket. No, when I you, have it on. When you're going on a plane, you have to have a coat because the planes always you go in there and they're blasting you. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. quite often, even in the summer, I've oh. got a jacket because of the plane. Absolutely. I got a sweater. I will always bring a jacket and a sweater. So she doubling up. All right. Well, lesson learned on my part. Lesson learned. Lesson I, learned. Uh, Mind you, he's like diamond medallion status. <laughs> not diamond. You're diamond, I'm sure. I'm what they call executive platinum on ooh, American ooh, Airlines, ooh. which used to actually be, I was thinking about this uh, today. So they merged with the U.S. Airways a few years back. But before, Executive Platinum would get you, like, I would say eight out of ten times you'd get upgraded to business class. Mm. Now it's, like, a little, like, around four to five out of ten. Because there's times where I'm like, I've, I've flown a lot. I go, how could these people have more status? And either people just have, just have money and are, and are buying business. Sure. Right. Or, or this whole merger, I don't even know what's happening. I just, I just sometimes get bunned up. But I, I, can, I can fall asleep anywhere on any plane. I'm ready to go. I'm having a, I do have a conflict sometimes. My, my girlfriend's traveling with me more often. Who's your Toba, girlfriend? Toba Silverman, <laughs> Joy Hill's manager. And uh, I'm a much higher status than her when it right. comes to Delta and Delta alone. And sometimes I get bumped up. And she don't? And she she does not no. And you leave and, her. Okay, so the rule that we've come up with, 
is if I have a show that night, I get it. Oh, baby needs to that sleep. Makes sense. And then otherwise, no. But is that's she, tough. Is she also your manager? No. no. Oh, okay. I was going to say if she's your manager, then she should be like you go in the front. Yeah. But why don't you guys just rotate? <laughs> wow. I didn't know that's the rule. The manager. They well, say, the manager should want you to be fresh. Sure. I would rather you do it because it's your girlfriend. Opposed to the girlfriend, girlfriend who doesn't give a <laughs> fuck yeah, yeah. if you're fresh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go fucking deal with it. Tell your jokes. What, you're a little tired? You'll yeah. be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah, no, I believe in my man. But he does have gold status now, and so when we book together, I get upgraded too. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can also always just be like, you went last time, I go this time. You know, the worst is when you give them or, or one of you takes it, and then, you know, everything's just like now business class, depending on where you're going. Like, you, you land and you go, how was it? They go, oh, the food was horrible. And the, this, that, the, and the complaining, you're like, uh, wh- How dare wh- you? why are we, why are we even doing this? Well, since you've been international, and this is the downside, what has the worst? I mean, how bad is America compared to the world, or is there places where you're like, you don't even know, we're well, holding on to the wings? <laughs> if you're talking about airlines, mo- I mean, most international airlines do a better job with their lounges, and like, you know, like you guys know how you go to some of these lounges, like. You know, whether it's American or United or something, they got like crackers and soup. And you're like, this is the lounge, you know, and then you go to some lounge for, I don't know, the Emirates or any, any airline in the you know international. And they'll be like, oh, you've got well, well, please have a seat. We'll take your order. And you're like, oh, he's going to take my order. Take my order. Ooh, yeah, that kind of never stuff. have oh, I my. ever, mom. <laughs> yeah. Rub some of that on me. Yeah. yeah like Turk- Turkish Airlines in, in Turkey, in Istanbul. Their lounge, like you go and it's got world different, like world foods. You know, you could be like, oh, let's get pizza, let's get uh, Indian, let's get sushi. It's got everything. It's well, pretty cool. So that's the lounges and the and the airplanes. But if you compare a lot of these countries with America, then America's you know definitely doing better than a lot of these other countries. <laughs> so you can fly well, but you don't uh, once stay you get or... there, it's yeah, it's all economy. Got it. <laughs> An economy life. <laughs> economy life. I guess it depends. Though again, Dubai and some of these places are still nice, but. Uh, but yeah, man, it's uh, it, the other thing you do sometimes is when you get into business and you go, oh, this is great. And then you just like, I feel a lot of times when I go international, you know how like they get the pig and they stuff it with apples. And all? I feel like I'm that by the time, because everything they bring, I'm like, yeah, I'll take the appetizer. I'll, I'll take the sure, dessert. Sure. I'll take more wine. <laughs> by the time I comedian. land, I'm like, oh my God, like what did I do? Just because it was there. I'm not drinking at these lounges. I feel like it's like, that's one of my rules. I don't really drink at clubs because I'm like, once I start. I need a hard rule, or I'm going to be drunk all the time. Listen. You drinking at the lounges? I'm drinking anywhere, especially if it's free. Get, bring mama some more drink. You off, You didn't offer us no alcohol. What alcohol? I remember getting fucked up in first class once, the first time ever, and it was like 7 a.m., and they're like, do you want anything to drink? And I was like, champagne. Yeah. And then I'm drinking, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? It's 7 in the morning. Well, they, oh, well, they, I remember. Come, they come by with that champagne early, right? But I, but as Almost you were just so. saying, I've been, I was on a plane at about 7 a.m. one time, and I'm, I, I, I sleep. And the girl next to me, the lady comes by, you, would, you want anything? She's like, yeah, let me get a, a, a vodka and tomato juice or whatever. And I was like, what's this? I go, this girl's got a drinking problem. And then she kept drinking. And at like 7 in the morning, I was like, oh, God. Yeah. And I felt bad for her. I wanted to be, have an intervention right there. Listen, Maz, just because I was sitting next to you on an airplane, know. you know, I got to tell my business <laughs> like that. <laughs> I remember my first time getting upgraded to first class. The woman asked, and I had never been like asking me what I want before the plane takes off. Yeah. And I was like, orange juice. And the guy next to me was like, vodka soda. And I was like, that's what we do it. He's like, that's what we do it. I said, all right, then that's what we do it. And we drank together like perfect degenerates. Party. At like 7 30 a.m. Party. <laughs> um, I watched your recent special. Birds and the Bees. Birds and the Bees. Okay, thank you for watching. Of it. course, one of more course. view. Uh huh. Nice. <laughs> but is that, so you, you did it at the comedy store? Yeah. And uh, is that story about getting into the comedy store? Is that f- fully tr- what happened? So would you would you mind uh, recounting it for us? Yeah, yeah. So the reason I did so so we all do you know when you when you call it a special you want it to be special. So I've done specials in different theaters, different cities, and I was like, well, what's going to be next? Was my next special? And I, th- and I said, well, I started in the comedy store. Let me do it at the comedy store. And so I tell the story of how I became a regular at the comedy store. Now, back in the day, what you would do is Mitzi Shore, who's the founder of the comedy store, for people who don't know, it's Polly Shore's mother. Um, and in the Can early. You you, like, did you. Was she fun? Was she scary? Was she. I watched the documentary of the comedy store, which yeah. felt a little. It was a little fluffy. It was a little yeah. fluff piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. They, 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 they very. Some people, they glide past it, kind of infer that. 
they hooked up with Mitzi. They went down on Mitzi, and yeah. that's how they got the I spot. Heard. And they do yeah. it like this, like, oh, sometimes you had to go down on Mitzi. <laughs> and then next yeah. shot, and you're like, whoa, like, are we going to yeah. talk about that? So so in the 70s, it was a wild time. And what had happened was Pauly Shore's father, Sammy Shore, uh-huh. had actually gone. He was a stand-up comedian. who He used to open for Elvis on the road. And he was actually a very funny guy. Um, he had a one-man show that I went and saw that was great. Uh, he would talk about how opening for Elvis, he'd be in Vegas, and the audience would be there to see Elvis, and they'd go, are you ready for Elvis Presley? Yeah. Are you ready for Elvis Presley? Oh, God. And they go, but first, Sammy Shore. <laughs> I'd have to go out. So his one-man show was called But First, Sammy Shore. And it was great. It was a great That's story. A brutal. I've never had to open for a musician. To me, that would be more stressful than almost any gig. Well, it depends, because I think from what I understand was this was an audience that was going to be friendly to him versus, like, you're not necessarily... I mean, I guess the idea is if that... If that band or musician chose you, then they've chosen you. Sure. So you, the audience better, you know, they they, they weren't there. It's not like a it's not like a club where uh, they're just throwing you up and you've never done stand up. You're you're pro. You're going up and you're probably going. I don't know what his opening line was, but I'm sure he had some line about. I want to like, know what that line was. You know, like That's hey folks, terrifying. you know, Elvis is taking a piss and he told me to come out here and keep you laughing for a little. Oh, you know, something like that. You know, and they're yeah. oh <laughs> this guy, you know, like. Whatever, whatever sure, it is. Sure, sure. You know, something to endear them to be like, I am too a fan of Elvis, you know? Seems like a tough crowd. Well, what would you do? Okay, someone asks you to go up for, hmm, what, what's the equivalent of Elvis these days? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Okay. Beyonce. 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 Yes. Beyonce. You, yes. you get called. Yes. Oh, uh, Beyonce's taking a dump. Yes. She needs 10 minutes. Yes. What are you, what are you coming How out there? How much money? <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's all I'm asking. How much okay, money? Okay, okay. That seems like a tough crowd. Gays are mean. Okay, but let's say you're getting, let's say five grand. You got to do grand? ten minutes. What's your first line? Well, how are you saying to this audience? Please, don't be mad. At me. It's not my fault. See, my instinct is to say something like Beyonce is lacing up her spanks or something. Cause sure, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and, and it's like our instinct to kind of like do a sneak diss, but I don't think they would appreciate that. But you got to also remember. But wait a minute now. This isn't Elvis in. And, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but I know at least in, I, maybe he was opening for him all over, but this was now Elvis in Vegas for sure. So once Beyonce goes to Vegas and has that 2,000-seat room yeah, yeah, where yeah. it's not as— Like an arena. Yeah, it's not as ruckusy. You know what I'm saying? It's like Adele's doing a residency right, right. now, or you too, and they and it's go— It's more touristy. It's not like the most ardent fans. It's yeah, also I mean, some... but, yeah, and there's probably an ardent fan, but, uh, but also you go out there. But, and, and by the way, again, I think that— it's intimidating, but I think once you get that key to that audience, yes. you know what I'm saying? Once you figure it out. Like, I had to follow. I followed, one time I followed uh, uh, Martin Lawrence at the Comedy Store, and I one time I followed, one time I went up when Pauly Shore had gone up, and Eddie Murphy had come into the room. Eddie Murphy had not, still hasn't made a comeback, but Pauly got Eddie to come from the main room to watch him in the original room, because mm-hmm. he knows him from back in the day. And then when Pauly's set was done... Paulie thought, thought Eddie was in the back of the original room watching him, but Eddie had already gotten up and left because Eddie knew Paulie was up to something. So Paulie, in front of this crowd, goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, guy, hey, ladies and gentlemen, you know, there's a guy who is a superstar, this, that, the other. He, he, we haven't seen him on stage in a long time. He's here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, come on up. Bring him up. Eddie Murphy. And the crowd's like, what? Losing their mind. Loses their mind. And everyone's, and then no, Eddie's coming because Eddie's already gone to the other room, the main room. Um, and then, and then he goes, Eddie, come on up. And then someone from the back, one of the workers goes, Eddie's not here. He goes, where is he? He goes, he went back to the main room. He goes, well, go get him. So then the guy goes, and Paulie's like talking like, hey, this, is, this guy came up here. He performed here back in the day, <laughs> this, that. You guys are going to see him for the first time in 25 years. He goes, he's going up on stage right now. And then, and then the guy comes back, and, and he goes, Paulie, I talked to Eddie. He goes, what did he say? He said, he said he's not coming. He's not coming. And he goes, all right, well, then who's next? And he goes, Maz Jobrani. Oh. And then he goes, all right, well, he's kind of like the Persian Eddie Murphy. He's oh, like, no. He's like, all right, come on up. Did the crowd I, go, okay, yeah. okay, sure. Rude you under the bus. But, but, but with that scenario and following Martin Lawrence, when Martin Lawrence had announced he's going to be in the room and only did a half an hour, both times I went up and I acknowledged, I go, guys, let me be, I go, hey, motherfuckers, I wanted to see Eddie too. Yeah. I don't want to see me. I wanted to see, I wanted to see more and more of Martin Lawrence. He was killing. You think I want to follow Martin? I go, you right. follow Martin Lawrence. So it starts, they, you know, I found the key to that audience to switch because I, was, I wasn't up there trying to pretend like, oh, I'm the shit. I was like, I, I was in the room when I saw what you guys just saw. Self-deprecate. Self-deprecate or I find the key. I would have to self-deprecate. I did, uh, it was Aziz at the cellar, but he was filming. 
and he was filming that special. So like when I went up, it was a big to do of camera people moving out. And my line was, "Oh, that feels good." I go on stage, they go, "Turn the cameras off, everyone get out of here." And that that was okay. Yeah, we've all had to follow yeah. wild people at the comedy cellar and the comedy store. A lot of people <laughs> do the oh, oh Seinfeld is opening for me. They're, I've heard that one enough. I'll just move on. <laughs> But you have you have to. This is what I learned. The, the good the good thing about coming up at the comedy store was, and I'll tell you the story in a second about what you. Yeah, yeah, asked, yeah. But the good thing about coming up at the comedy store was we had to like first of all she would put us once you became a regular she would put you up midnight and behind you know Andrew Dice Clay Paul Mooney Eddie Griffin whoever it is these guys going hard. Um, and sometimes you'd get bumped, bumped, bumped until like one thirty. Yeah. And you learn, I learned quickly, you have to acknowledge what just happened before. And the one time I always remember Joe Diaz went on stage and Joe Diaz was really good at just, you know, one night it was hot and he was blowing up this room just left and right, just boom, 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 15 minutes of just hard, hard laughter. When he was done, people just got up and started scattering and going to pee and smoke and whatever. And I went on stage, and I think I didn't acknowledge what had just happened. I tried to get into my act, and it was about like ten minutes of like just nobody paying attention, and then five minutes of maybe getting them and thank you, good night. Yeah. So I realized yeah. now when I watch, I'm just sitting there going like, "What's the key? What's the key?" So recently I was at the Laugh Factory, and Trevor Wallace was up, and I brought my mom, and my mom has a friend who is a one of the queens of Malaysia. So, like, she happened to be there that night. My mom doesn't come to a lot of my shows, but she's like, the queen of Malaysia is here. We're coming to your show. And Trevor Wallace was on stage. He's 25 years old or so. He's got a bit about going down on a girl and having a vibrator next to it and being intimidated by the vibrator. It's a funny bit. But I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm like, oh, my God. And the crowd's loving it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, my mom's here with the my- queen. <laughs> and I'm kind of looking over, and my mom's laughing. And I'm like, is she understanding this? Because my mom's Iranian. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I don't know if she's getting it. And the queen's kind of got a smile, but she's not. She, I, don't know if she, I don't know if they're getting it or not. So the, or is that wishful thinking? Maybe they're like, that's moms, ex- we have vibrators too. Well, that's exa- so, moms have so, vibrators. Yeah, so, also, I just want to say, I was like, is it Trevor Noah or George Wallace? I didn't know. No, Trevor which, Wallace. I don't Trevor, know Wallace. Trevor Wallace. Trevor I haven't Wallace met him yet. is like a uh, uh, YouTube guy. Sorry, there's a hair here. I, I, you, darling. Yeah. YouTube star. He, like, you know, he became he like uh, influencers, got okay. millions of followers. A young guy. Anyway, so More I. More money than all of us sure. yeah. combined. And so I sat there and I was like, okay, what's the key to this? Because again, I wanted to get into my act, but I also have to take them from this frame of mind of, and it's the Laugh Factory, probably a lot of young people, got to take them from the frame of mind of sexual material to my life, and I want to do well in front of my mom and, my, and, and, and this queen, and, um, and I did exactly, like, I went up on stage, I said, give it up for Trevor Wallace, I said, but I got to admit, I go, my mom's here tonight, and I go, when he was doing the joke about going down and the vibrator, I was like, I was like, oh my God, and I look over at my mom, I said, my mom's laughing, I was like, mom, what the hell, so that, Earned, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the you know the not the respect, but it earned like it it put me in the room. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And then I was able to go from there. Sure. Right. Um. So going back to what you guys were saying about who you're gonna you're opening up for a superstar, I think you gotta call it like it is. You can't pretend like you're too cool for school. Like, hey, right. what's up? You guys are so lucky. I'm here tonight. Yeah, Beyonce's in the back. She'll be here soon. Just shut up. I mean, I mean unless if that's your act. You know what I'm saying? Right. Sure, sure. Yeah. I wish I was Beyonce too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I like yeah. that. Yes, I yeah. like that. Okay, come on, master class. Master class. <laughs> and also, I think I think there's also like obviously there's a lot of cheerleading you get. You know, you guys want to see me? Yeah, come on. You know, she's coming out. Oh my god. You know, whatever that is. But anyway. By, by the way, if you get tapped by one of these people, this probably means you're you're good enough to be tapped by one of those people. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, I'm a I'm a great opener. I love I actually yeah, yeah, yeah. love opening. I, I know I got I'm transitioning into headliner, which just seems like too much heavy lifting for yeah. me. I love opening, I, especially for people who have a set. It has, so it's much more pressure. I, oh. I'll headline. I'd, I'd rather do 90 minutes than open for five. I mean, it's a different. I'd rather open for 20. Ooh. Opening for 20 in a theater. Oof. It all depends who the audience is. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Because there's also like the whole thing of like, I'm not afraid of you, motherfucker. Like, that's, that's, that's the whole thing. That's, that's the whole Bernie Mac thing, right? Yeah, Where yeah, he went yeah. up, he's like, I'm not scared of you. So that they, you know. But but it's either way. I think it's it can either one can be intimidating. I mean, twenty five years into this, there's times sometimes when I'm sitting, and I'm like, oh my god, how am I gonna follow this? What am I? What am I? How am I gonna get into this? You know, it's like, and and sometimes you're sitting, you're looking at the audience, you're like, God, these these people are a lot younger than me. They're not gonna care about oh, my yes. shit. You're yeah. in your head. You know what I'm saying? 
So I can't imagine, like you said, if I'm looking out, I'm Sammy Shore, and I'm like, oh my god, these people are dressed as Elvis. They want me. They're gonna say, yeah. cut first Sammy Shore. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. So, so, so anyway, you you auditioned. So, so the way, so Mitzi back in the day, it was wild. So Sammy got the club. He ends up going back on tour. Mitzi eventually divorces Sammy, keeps the club, becomes like the the uh, the queen mother of the club. And so back then, all these comedians, she'd be dating some of them. There'd be like you know uh, drugs, there's sex, there's all kinds of stuff. Was and, she young? Was she like older? And she was like, no, she was like she wasn't as like some of them were really. You got like your Jim Carrey's coming through. And he's, I don't know, 20 or you something. Think, you think her and Jim Carrey? I don't know about Jim Carrey, but I think like I'd heard things like, you know, again, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if she got with Richard Pryor. There was a guy named Argus Hamilton, for, for sure, Argus Hamilton, who still performs, who's I think like, Late seventies, he wow. still comes in a suit. Argus, Does he used have to, to hook up with the current Booker. He could, he hooks up with the current Booker. He hooks up with whoever he follows. Um, no, Argus was Argus is a is a comedy store legend because back in the seventies, he was one of these guys who would guest host for uh, Johnny Carson and all. But he mm. also had a big drug problem. So and he was dating Mitzi. There was a lot going on with Argus, and then he gets clean, and now he shows up in a suit. And he's got all political, all like of the day jokes, and it's joke, 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 joke. He opens the shows, and people love it, and he kills, and it's just it's inspiring. Man, it, drug problems really took some of the spice out of the the comedy world. I don't know what it's like in L.A. where there's still cocaine, but I feel like drugs are not where there's still cocaine. Well, I just there's like no cocaine like, in New York. No, there's cocaine, <laughs> but like I don't know. It's definitely not like I have no like. Oh yeah, this this guy is always at this place drugged up, maybe a little drunk at the most. Yeah. But we, we lost that. Drunk and that high. sounds like it was exciting. Well, no, I think that was probably more 70s. There's been a couple of times where I've been in the hallways of the comedy store with a bunch of comics all holding bottles of water going, Sam Kinison's rolling over in his grave right now going, like, you guys are doing what? Right, yeah. right, like, right. Meanwhile, You're he hydrating? Brought, yeah, he brought a gun to the club and, like, shot a hole in the wall and, like, dice will During the set? It. No, like, I don't know what he was doing. He's drunk. He's fucked up. I don't know what happened. Like, he, there's, a, there's a place to go. That's where Kinison shot the thing. Uh, uh, you own a gun? You could do this? I do own a gun. Yeah. Dice, Dice had a story. He, you know, Dice was a good storyteller. He's like, one time I gave this guy the cave punch. I go, what? He's like, yeah, the guy was talking shit. And I said, da 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 da. And then he comes up, up around the side of the main room and he's coming up around the side. And I see him coming and I go, boom. And my fist goes into his chest. You know, like he knocks some guy out. You know, so it's just like from the stage. But, I mean, no, the guy came up around like he was because the, there's a oh, the, in the, the entrance in the entrance in the main room is in the yeah. back. You know, it's I'm just saying like they used to be a lot wilder than yeah. they are. Yeah, right? no, very. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So the way wild. you become a regular. So then what happens is Mitzi. The way you used to become a regular, you used, to, you, used to, you used to have to perform three minutes, six minutes, ten minutes in front of her, and you would do three. They say come back a few weeks later. Six, come back a few weeks later. Ten. And it was during the open mic night, so it was all shitty comics and shitty crowd until you got to showcase. It was not set up for the best thing, and and once in a while you'd be, you know, you've you've, you've struggled to get your showcase, and some regular, someone who's a regular at the club, will come sit next to her and talk during your whole set. Yeah, yeah. You're like motherfucker, what are you doing, man? So I went up, I did my three. This was, I think it was ninety nine or two thousand. I'm so bummed, I don't know the exact date, and I've, I've been looking for it, but I did three. Uh, then six, then ten. I came back and did all, and then after the ten, this is what happened. Was so back then, I was talking a lot about my Iranian background, and I still talk about it, but not as much. I mean, it's still part of it, but not the thing. But back then, it was the thing. I was new to comedy, and then I I finish it, and I'm thinking to myself, Eddie Murphy was my comedy was my comedy hero. He'd been at the comedy store. I wanted to be there. I was like, this is the beginning of my future, my career. And so from the original room, when you come off, it's about you know 60 feet to the exit sign where there's the stairs you go down Mitzi's sitting in a chair right next to the exit you got to pass by her and the whole time I'm thinking so you want her to grab your arm if she grabs your arm that means you're going to become a regular it means you're going to go fuck her you're going to go fuck her exactly <laughs> you have to yeah, go you're down. going down on her uh, if she lets you walk if she grabs by, your head you are yeah yeah forget it you go down on every employee <laughs> <You> grab um, <laughs> the crotch uh, if, you, if she lets you walk by you're screwed like don't Oof. come back like go work for two more years and come back so we have our own version of S D E A A S. You walk right. up the stairs if she says sit over here. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, it's terrible. It's oh yeah. Te- it's, and it's I've ter- seen it happen to other people. Not get it. I've seen it too. I got I've the sit it down. Too. It's all very mafia. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because in your mind, all the, by the way, it, it's early in your career. Yes, once in a while, comedians come from another city and they're already established or they're touring and they don't really need it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take it, but I don't need it. But when you're living in that city. 
and you're young, you're like, I need this. this I need is, it. <laughs> this is part of my step towards. I'll go down yeah, yeah, on yeah. you. Yeah, I'll go down. What is it? Excuse me. I'll <laughs> yeah. suck your dick. Excuse me. I will suck your dick. Even if you don't have a dick, I'll suck it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, she goes, she grabs my arm, and I've done now 10 minutes about being Iranian in America and all that. And you killed. And I had a good set, yeah. right? I had a good set. And then so she goes, you're very funny. That's how she used to talk. You're very funny. I go, thank you, Mitzi. She goes, uh, I'm going to make you a regular. I go, thank you, Mitzi. And she goes, have you thought about wearing the outfit? I go, what outfit? She goes, you know, the hat and the gown. I go, hat and gown? She goes, you know, the hat and the gown. So she's making a little spinning thing. That's a turban. The spinning thing means turban. I was like, oh, uh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah, sure. Oh, my God. How old are you at this point? I'm in my mid-20s. Oh. I'm just starting. I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm not. Say, I'm not. Gonna, I'm, I'm not about to sit there and have a debate with her. Yeah. And this is, by the way, late '90s, early 2000s, when this shit is still like okay. Okay. Yeah. Did you right. have any like? Uh, were you like? Oh, I don't do. I'm not gonna ever do that. Like, did you have opinions, or you're like whatever? No, no. I had the opinion, but I thought. I thought like right now in this moment where there's a club and there's another comic going up and. And this club owner who I'm intimidated by is giving me the thing I need and is asking me to wear this thing. I'm just going to say yes. And, and, and by the way, she was getting old at that point. And in my mind, I was like, she'll forget by the time Monday rolls around. This is on a Sunday. I but think they, if I went up and ST was like, do the little... The curly, the side. Exactly. Like, oh, the do more Ju- Hasidic. Do more Jewish. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's wild. So I was like, I go, okay. And then I, and then I go to the back back hall and i'm like what did i just agree to do and i was like okay she's she's gotten older she'll forget by monday and then that's when the comedy the booker called me and she goes hey moz congratulations i heard uh you got passed i go yes i did she goes and mitzi said you're gonna wear the outfit i was like oh and she didn't even know like what what is the outfit what the is outfit is called? like a dishdasha like a, a, what's how do you dish say dasha dishdasha dish dasha. is the is like the white gown and then a turban like she wanted me because this is the thing mitzi had these Mitzi had these ideas. Supposedly, she helped Roseanne create her character by going shot clothes shopping for her and saying, "You're this Midwestern girl. You need to dress the part." Originally, Roseanne wore a dishdasha. She yeah, wore the shirt. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. She was the original. <laughs> um, she told. I've heard Mark Maron tell the story that she told him that you're the think thinking comic, so you should have a scarf. Like you're the poet. Oh, um, supposedly, I died. did a scarf. I did a scarf for early on. I had six months of a scarf. It was awful. It go. was awful. Bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> you have a You're cigarette. Very, yeah, yeah, very French. Uh, a little beret. Um, um. So, 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 supposedly she had this this idea for others, but later on, I come to find out like there was a guy who used to do this thing where where he would do his act, and then towards the end of his act, he would get into a banana suit. So she saw him one time, and she's like, you should be the banana the whole time. You should be Jackie Bananas. That's his name. And then I was like, whatever, Jackie Bananas. They're like, he disappeared. I go, all right. So she does. They're not all hits. They're not all hits. <laughs> You know, they're not all yeah, great ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one Wait. day he's he's hosting at Bananas in New Jersey and going like, okay, I think it's time to take this off. It's time yeah. to take it off. So uh, did you ever do it? No, I didn't. So what happened did you was... Think, did you ever think... No, no, no. Right away I was like, I got to get out of this. Because because if nothing else, I was like, I'm going to be the laughing stock of all the other comics. <laughs> and, and by the way, I was like, I don't want to do it. So now at the, at the time I was doing a sketch comedy show. Like I was at a you know some some group out there. And I was a big fan of Eddie Murphy's. Eddie Murphy had done Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood, which was a play off Mr. Uh, Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and I had thought about a sketch back then. This is like right around the time when this is right. This is before September 11th, but the whole terrorism thing was happening. There was a lot, and, and a lot, and there was what jokes. was the what was the like uh, point of reference for terrorism before 9/11? It was bin, people knew Bin Laden. Bin Laden. They knew like Bin Laden. The they, knew, they knew Saddam. They knew the there, there was enough. There was enough of that. In so what happened was I think I think like when the when the Soviet Union fell, Islamic uh, like the I- Islamic uh, fundamentalism and like terrorism and stuff became public enemy number one. So yeah. it, it sure. came into the limelight. Like I remember actually being in college back then. They were like, "Who's going to be the next villain? Who's going to be the next boogeyman?" Muslims. And so some of the jokes that I would do played off of like making fun of that. So I thought. Yeah. So I wanted to do a sketch. It was in my mind. I didn't write it, but I was. I wanted to do like Mr. Rahim's neighborhood, where it's this guy and he's Arab or whatever, this, that, the other, and he's like, you know, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Rahim. So I said to them, I said, I said to Corey, I go, Corey, what if I do my act, and then towards the end of the act, I got a character and I bring out the character. She goes, that's pretty good. And then, and then I was like, all right, let me keep thinking about it. Then I was like, all right, what if I do. Like Rudolph Valentino used to play this character named the Sheik, and the yeah. Sheik yeah, yeah, yeah. was like he was a leading man, and he was like a, a lover, you know, like you know. So I go, what if I do the? Because I go, one of my problems is I go, I don't want to play like the bad guy. I don't want to. I don't want to feed that stereotype. But what if I play like the good, like the 
the the the Arabian Lover, and she yes. and 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 the girl Corey, who was the book at the time, loved like movies from that era. So she was a big. She's like, I love. It. I'm gonna tell Mitzi you're gonna be the the lover. You know, I was like, and and I lo- and I walked. Such out. a different time in stand up comedy. Louise, this is like wrestling telling, characters, telling pretty you much. what to do on stage by and the way, what to wear as well. By the way, I don't think I don't think that all the comics were getting that. Although a lot of a lot of club owners do stuff like that, where they'll be like, you need to do more of this. Like they give that advice. You know what I feel like Mitzi would have told me? She would have been like, you're gay you lean into it gay lean uh, into you're it. not gay like that's what she would uh, say uh, i yeah. know it yeah you're Esty gay loves that i dress up i'll tell you that she yeah. encourages it yeah she hates the way comics dress uh, these days uh, um <laughs> the one place i've never worn shorts still the comedy cellar <laughs> yes kills me. good do not wear shorts at the comedy cellar but that's what i'm saying it. so the com- the club owners all have ideas and they think they're giving good advice but ultimately it's about you know comedy is finding your voice right comedy is therapy yeah yeah, yeah. And you got to find that and so i knew in my heart that i didn't want to do this but i kept negotiating things where they'd be like that's it great do that and then i'd be like oh, i don't i still don't want to do it so then I had to come up with a way, and the two excuses I used, one was my father was living in Iran at the time. And so I said, listen, if word gets back that there's this comedian in the U.S. making fun of the mullahs, by the way, the the turbans that she's talking about, like the shtasha, the Arab turban is different than the mullah turban is different than the Everyone's got different turbans. But I go, if, they get, if word gets back that I'm making fun of them somehow, it could put my father in danger. And I said, more importantly, nice. I found, well, another one that I found was even better was there was this guy. So just like you have like Telemundo and all the like Spanish channels, you have like a, 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 a handful of Iranian networks. Yeah. And they all are always just talking shit about the government of Iran because it's a dictatorship and it's a, and it's a um, religious dictatorship. So they make fun of them. So, so they're was, all American uh, funded, or like no, it's them- mostly. Mo- usually, it's either it's either like some Iranian person came here and set this up. It's not. It's not like they're not that advanced. Like they got like when you go sure. when you go to you know do something do an interview with their network. It's usually one guy is running everything, and then the guy who's the host is like you know barely putting on his tie, and he's like, all right, let's do, you know. It's 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 very much. It's it's very ripe for like a. TV show or a movie around it of some guy who's basically it's it's like one step above cable access. Almost. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, but it's critical of the government. Critical internet. of the government. Yeah. But now the truth is like that. This was twenty something years ago. Now there are a couple of networks that are really well run, and they the funding is either coming from like opposition groups, sure, or like Saudi Arabia has some funding, which is which was an enemy of Iran. So it's it's, it's all very complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in that case, there was a guy who used to who used to dress as the mullahs and make fun of them. And his whole thing was so his audience are Iranians in the diaspora, so he's making fun of the mullahs, people are laughing, etc. So he goes to some political rally in Los Angeles, and I guess some supporters of the mullahs showed up, and they threw rocks, and one of them hit them in the eye and blinded him in one eye. Oh, my God. Yeah. So you told that story. That's what I called with. <laughs> So I call that. I go listen. I go listen, Corey. I can do this, but I just want you to know there's a guy who was doing something similar. They showed up. They threw a rock. They blind. So I, go, I could do it. They could come attack me. They could attack the club. And oh, then, they could attack you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so she was like, "Let me call you back." She called Mitzi, and then she calls him back. She goes, "Mitzi said just wear something comfortable. You'll be fine." And oh my and the God. funny thing is, because she was old, I thought she'd totally forgotten about it until like a year or so later. She. Now, the other thing Mitzi used to do is she used to put like theme nights together. The women of the comedy store, Black Night, Latino Night. So she wanted to do Arabian Nights with all uh-huh. like Middle Eastern Muslim comics. This was in 2000 when there was an uprising with the Palestinians, Israelis, and she was Jewish. She was watching CNN, and in her mind, I guess it used to be contentious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. In her mind, that was in the past. In her mind, she thought that like if I need to do a show with Muslim comedians to just show like peace and, and the, the the other side. So she put us together and she called it the Arabian Nights and she would put us up and 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 you know she was giving us a lot of love. And then one time we were sitting with her at the La Jolla comedy store and she was just going down the line talking to each of the comics and then she gets to me and she's like you know she's like telling one of them like you're doing great, you're fantastic, that that and you you were supposed to wear the outfit. And I was like, oh my God, you still remember? Wow. Like, yeah, you got away. I go, yeah, I go, thank God. She you look back fixated. on on those kinds of nights, because uh, Joelle and I actually just did uh, the ethnic show at JFL. Yes. Which I guess we were, t- I've been told 
Uh, first, it's, it's called Just, for, Just the culture, for the Culture, but they keep the ethnic show as a subtitle. It's, yeah. it's the dumbest thing Formally in the world. Formerly the ethnic show. I, I, was, the I was the host of it many years when it was yes. the ethnic show. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. But then someone told me that before that, there was, was like the black show, the Italian show, the Jews show. They might have. You know, so what happened was uh, years ago, they started doing this ethnic show, and they would bring us. It, was, it, it took me a while to realize. Like, I, it was so, it was, you know... Quite often, I was hosting. You'd have Godfrey on there. You'd have uh, 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 Alonzo, Sebastian Menes. Yes. Alonzo, Alonzo was our host. Yeah, Modi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had all everyone is different kind. Of, you know, I don't know if Kira Sultanovich was there. Melissa, Melissa Via Senior. I, I, I did many years. It took me a while to realize they would bring us in the first week, and then they would bring the nasty, nasty show in the second week, and we'd do about two weeks, and then right when everybody arrived, we'd leave. Yes, and I was yeah. like, I was like, yeah. well, I'm not part of a festival. I'm just helping, you know. I'm just performing. Like, we're, I'm not getting a chance to schmooze with anybody. And so it took a while for me to go. If you guys are gonna bring me out, then keep me for some of these galas. So you you, you walked so we could run. Thank you. Thank yes, you, because they yeah. kept us. They they did our show simultaneously, us with the nasty show, and then they kept us when everyone got there. I like, made we, a point for them to understand that, and then and then boss. by the way, I'll be honest with you. Then I ended up doing Howie Mandel's gala, and the crowd sucked. And I was like, "What the hell's wrong with these people? <laughs> uh, I'll just stick with my uh, ethnic show." Yeah. When you look back at like Mitzi, and do you see her as like she? Because obviously these are like racist idea the concept of like do the full character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, was she giving like? Opportunities in a way that others weren't before. Like, do you see her as absolutely? A mover? No, yeah. Listen, we cu- listen, listen, listen. First of all, it's it's easy to go back and be like, oh, you did this thirty years ago. You go well back then. This is kind of what it was accepted. Now, was it right? Right. In this, in in the mirror we have now, no, it wasn't. But that's what was happening. So Mitzi, I think I I love her for that. I think like because the truth is the industry didn't know what to do with us, and they like even now like once in a while, you know, now you get like you get. Aziz, you get Mo Amr, you get uh, uh, you know Hassan Manat, you get a handful of like Mindy Kaling. Some people come through a little bit, but they still don't know. And there's been times where like I try to I try to drive home the point of like if you come to a show like I when I perform at the comedy store, comedy cellar, wherever, the audience is mixed and the yeah. comedians are mixed. Yeah. And hopefully, if you're getting laughs, you're getting laughs in front of everybody. Sure. And so to, to go in front of executives who go, well, I don't know if people want to see a story about an Iranian guy married to an Indian woman. That's my wife's, you know, of Indian descent. I don't know if people want to see that. I go, well, well, if I could, try it because try the fact it. is, as long as we get a diverse writing team and we and and we realize that we all a lot. When I like, I used to early on, I used to do like, oh, my parent, my Iranian parents this, Iranian parents that. Then I go, wait a minute, immigrant parents this, immigrant parents that. Then I realize a lot of parents do this. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so I think Mitzi, in a way, was was um, was definitely at the forefront of giving us an opportunity because sure. even though there was that thing of like, oh, you're the Arabian Nights. Well, thank you for. For finding a way to put something to it that then made us go, okay, now let's go get our audiences out. When September, we were doing comedy before September 11th, but when September 11th happened, we got so much press because everyone was like, who are these Middle Eastern or Muslim comics talking about this? What do you, you know? When, how soon after did the press start? Right like, away. They were curious. They were like, what are you doing? How, we got calls from the New York Times. We got calls from, you know, Time Magazine. We were, we, we went from Hustler Magazine all the way to Time Magazine, all the way to like, you name it. Was they were it, was it, uh, were the good times? Not, not, I, I understand. A tragedy aside, yeah. was it? Was it? Did it feel like? <laughs> did it? You look back, you're like, my if career. We look at your career. Was it like 9/11? Poo! It was funny you said that because I remember I, I was at some radio show and somebody somebody said they go they go wow 9/11 was good for your career, huh? And I was like I was like you know what I don't like you saying that. I go would you say that? <laughs> would you say that slavery was good for a black comedian's career? Right. Would you say the Holocaust was good? <laughs> go, That's not cool to say that because we were doing it before. And the attention that came with it was definitely for the press it was good. But again, I think the industry still didn't know what to do with it. Like the industry, I'll tell you what happened with the industry. So we come out, uh, you know, we're just doing stand-up. And, and you know, stand-up, we all, I think we would agree stand-up is one of the lower respected art forms of all the art forms. Because, yeah. you know, you, you could be, we all know there's people killing it in some club, but nobody knows who the hell they are. Because no, they're not coming out to discover this person. I feel you. Yeah, so listen, that, that's why I'm here to <laughs> you let you know, John Marco, it ain't never going to happen. Uh, uh, but no, but but we, so so in, I don't know what it was, 2002 or three or something, there's an there's an Iranian um, British comedian named Omid Jalili. He's very funny friend of mine 
and uh, he was at Just for Laughs, mm -hmm. and he did very well. He was doing material there that you know about being of that background. Did very well, and NBC gave him a deal. And this is how I mean, it's almost it's almost cliche. This is how the 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 industry works. So that so when NBC gave him a deal. The, the other show is called The Outfit. The Outfit. Mm -hmm. um, the other networks then wanted to find their Middle Easterner. So yeah. then we get a call from a from Fox going, they want to like have a meeting. They want to talk to you. Do you have any show ideas? I was like, I, I don't. The show starts at 9, 11 p.m. It was 9, 11 p.m. <laughs> exactly. That's See, you should have been the marketer for that thing. Uh-huh. Um, but that's so that's so weird. For for it to be like that, but to work in your favor at the same time. Well, it worked in my favor, but at the same time, they didn't know what to do with it. So it's like I went and I sat down. I go, look, I, you know, the, the truth is, I at the time, um, I was I was dating my then girlfriend, now wife, who's of Indian descent. I was living with my mother and my grandfather. So I explained to them what my situation. I go, it's kind of like multi generational house. Um, got my girlfriend as a lawyer. She's you know she's a high powered attorney. I'm this guy working in an ad agency or whatever, like a day job. Like I, so you know, somebody could sit there and go like, "Oh, this I could build a show around this, right?" Sounds like a show to me. Sounds like a show to me. Sure, why not? But they didn't know what to do, and I think a lot of it was like, "Well, you know, you know, who's who, you, you're not you you I, at that point that they didn't want that diversity." Yeah, they were like, "How are we going to get a room full of ten white guys to write this?" How, exactly, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also, and also, what, what, like, well, okay, so what if your wife's white and your parents are white too? Some they adopted you. Yes. Yeah, they adopted yeah. you. And 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 part so that's what I'm saying is like so so these clubs gave us a chance to develop and talk about what's on our minds and and the audiences that came out. So the 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 bigger thing than the press that came with it was that there was an audience waiting for us. It was like waiting for Godot. It's like they were waiting for us. So yeah. when we first came out, our stars rose really fast because there was there was Arabs and Muslims and liberal Americans and others who wanted to hear our stories. So we'd go to these cities and like a thousand people would show. We're doing theaters before we were, you know, we even yeah. had a chance to go through the clubs. So it was interesting because it not the uh, people wanted to hear what we had to say, and it was cool to to have that experience. But then again, it never translated in the industry to like, oh well, now let's do a show around that. Yeah, was that the Axis of Axis Evil? Of evil yeah, <laughs> yes. was the Axis of Evil comedy tour. I remember that. Yeah. That yeah, that's when I first started comedy. I started in L.A. There you go. And I used to like be like a little puppy watching you guys at the comedy store, yeah. hoping to get wow. past. Yeah. yeah, never got past. Moved before I did, but you guys like really. Inspired me then. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make Mitzi come. What what happened exactly? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I like penises. <laughs> it's um, my plate. I'd love to talk about so you. You were born in Iran. Yes. And you left at seven, six, yeah. six. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember a lot growing up there? All I remember. So Iran before the Islamic Revolu Revolution of seventy nine was. Pretty Western in ways, or modern, I should say. Um, the Shah of Iran had been modernizing it, and um, and we had a lot of Western influence. Was um, it? Was it? Because uh, I, I certainly, I feel like I've been reading more about, uh, uh, you know, the protest recently. Yeah, and they show pictures from. Before that, like, were women voting? Forgive my ignorance on it. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask that. I was like, am I ignorant to ask? Listen, I don't know about the rights of women to vote and all that. I do know that back in the day, like, they didn't have to cover themselves. If they, you chose to, you could. But there was a lot of women walking around, like, you know, mini skirts, and there was discos and men and women together and drinking and all that. It was not Islamic. It was, it was very much uh, a, a much more open society. Now, the Shah had his own, like, you know, secret police that would, if you criticized him, you would disappear. There was there was problems, but sure. it was not at all what it ended up becoming because what happened was this Islamic government that took over basically promised, because part of, it's all, it's all so complicated, right? So the Shah is getting richer and richer because he is, um, you know, selling oil to the West and, and and buying weapons from the West, and Iran's becoming stronger and stronger. And a Shah is, uh, is president equivalent? He's is the a, king. No, he's the yeah, king. king. He's the king. Yeah. And so that's why, so so there was people that didn't like the Shah, and the thing was, like, there was, so that you have the you have the religious group that does you know, the Muslim, the you know, Khomeini and his folks that don't like the Shah because they go, you know, you're... You're you're too open and 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 we and we want a more devout society. Yeah. And you've got like the intellectuals who are saying, well, we can't criticize or say anything without disappearing, right? Right. Um, then you've got other different factions that are against the Shah. And eventually, what happens is all these factions come together, 
and they protest, and then the Shah leaves in 79. And there was actually a great documentary that came out last year when these protests were happening in Iran. Uh, it was called Hostages, and it was all about um, what happened in Iran when the when when the religious when the Muslims took over the 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 Khomeini's people took over, they ended up um, they they took power and quickly like women then had to all cover themselves up. Then like you know LGBTQ was being discriminated against. How then, quick did it did it move? It's so wild it was, to think of. I mean, obviously we've seen in America a a, a, a conservative bend like backwards severely, but yeah. like it seems to go from you see the pictures of women in the miniskirts and you're like. Dude, how it's, fast? It's crazy how fast it goes. Because what happens is, listen, it's it's all about what they promise, and this is what, like, in my eyes, I can see so clearly the MAGA movement, the 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 parallels with that movement and what happened there. Because because what they do is they promise you a better life. So Khomeini goes, listen, once we get rid of the Shah, there won't be uh, a disparity of wealth. Because under the Shah, if you were you know successful with the Shah, or you were in the government, you're going to do well. If you weren't, you were poor. So yeah. Khomeini goes, everyone's gonna, we're gonna, everyone's gonna be fed, um, and it's gonna be a much better. So it's gonna be a utopia, yeah. which is what you know. The the thing I keep saying about like MAGA is like they very, they're very good at complaining, right? The 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 border, sure, and then our children, are abortion, abortion, and this. The, but then you go, well, what's your solution? They don't really have solutions, and and their solutions tend to be autocratic solutions. Well, only I can fix it. That's what Donald Trump said, right? So Khomeini becomes a charismatic leader. He's the guy who, whatever he says, goes. And was he ultimately elected or the the, the, the Shah just left? Over. The, the Shah, Shah left. Like, when you left. say he left, did they kick him out? Well, like, he, he just so pro, so, pro, so the protest. So what happened was there was protests and what would happen is like there'd be a protest and then the and in the past the Shah had the military, they would show up and they would shut down the protest. But in this case, like the military would go and they would shoot into the crowds and some people would die. Sure. And then and then the next protest would get bigger because now people are going, like, Oh wow, you're killing your own people. So now you're getting professionals joining the protest. So lawyers and doctors are coming. Now the bazaar, the people who own the bazaar, the bazaris they call them, they're closing it down. They're showing up. They're closing down the bazaars. So yeah. all the businesses start shutting down. And the protests get bigger and bigger. And every time they shoot into the crowds or somebody dies, more people join. And so eventually there's this charismatic leader, Khomeini, who's a religious leader who really doesn't know anything about politics. But in, I guess in the Quran, it says like that's the only book you need for politics. For like Khomeini even like supposedly uh, famously said that like, because there was a brain drain. Doctors, lawyers, everybody leaves. And Khomeini famously is like, we don't need doctors. We'll train doctors in a few months. We'll be good to go. So... This the whole country just like goes down. I mean, the economy goes down. Everything goes down. But but what happened was this charismatic leader that is there now, and and it's kind of like the Catholic Church because Iran is Shiite Muslim. The, uh -huh. the with Shiite Muslim is very much a hierarchical system, and they go, okay, this guy, the 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 Khomeini, the Imam, has a direct tie with with uh the god and like yeah. it's kind of like god told me that you know he's he basically is the word of god so you gotta if you're religious you're gonna be like whatever he says goes and then the when the military now is under his influence and you know he's obviously got other people that probably are running the government and the sort but he gives these sermons thousands of people show up and you know he'll but but quickly he goes from what was supposed to be a utopia to hey why don't we execute all of the previous, you know, generals and everybody else, like, yeah. and it becomes brutal. They start executing hey, people. What hey, yeah. I have an idea. And then your parents were like, "We gotta get out of well, here." Well, my dad already. We left late '78. My dad had been successful. He'd been a businessman, been successful under the Shah. So he told my mom he, he was on. Was business. he at the protest or was he like? Oh, no, 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 like no. The Shah. My dad, no, my dad liked the Shah, and my dad uh, was a success. He had an electric company. He'd been doing very well. I always, I, the, 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 the character that I always reference my dad to is uh, Vito Corleone in The Godfather. He was a guy you'd yeah. go to, he would get shit done for you. And he was you very. You know Vito? You've seen him? Get out of here. Uh, some people, so like you that. never know. You, you never know. How dare you disrespect yeah, yeah, yeah. me? I'm 42 she years old. Is smart. <laughs> come to me. But 20 year olds have no idea. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he, uh, so yeah, he, so he had come on business to New York and he actually called my mom. My mom told me this recently. She goes, you know, she goes, um, your dad called me and said, I'm not coming back because if I come back, my life could be in danger. 
And he said, get the kids and come. And my mom was like, come on, I can't be that serious. He's like, no, get the kids and come. So my mom actually brought me and my older sister, uh, and we were only going to come for two weeks, thinking that the protest would quiet down. We'd go back. So we left my baby brother back in Iran. Oh, yeah. With who? who? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nannies and grandmas and aunts. And it was a big, you know, it was a, the, there was a big network of family. Were Do you, you remember a the rich protest? Kid, Mas. Huh? Huh? Yeah, a rich, rich kid. kid? Yeah, yeah, I was a rich kid. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, no, well, well we, we, listen, I grew up, I grew up in Marin County, Northern, so we came with a lot, my dad, back in, back in the day, I talk about this sometimes in my stand-up, like, we go to Marin County where there's a lot of wealth, but it's subtle, so the guy's like the CEO of Wells Fargo, but he's, you know, got a sob, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And I go, uh-huh. even, I go, even the car sounds sad, it's sob, <laughs> but I go, my dad, he can't help himself. He comes to Marin County. He buys a Rolls Royce. Of course. During the hostage crisis. I'm going, you're going to... And he puts me in the back of the... puts me in the back of the Rolls. He drives me to school. I swear, I used to have him like... I was like, drop me off a few blocks away. I don't want to be seen in your fucking Rolls Royce because I'm already getting bullied or kids think I'm like... I, I, own, I own oil wells. Yes. I'm ducking. Like, I see these girls that are like... I'm, a, You know, that are, that are cute girls that I like. I, I like and I see them. I'm like, oh, shit. I duck underneath. And like, some people might have been like, oh, let me wave and be like, hello, I'm rich kid. Yeah. I knew back then. I go, this is not a good look at all. That's, you and Victoria Beckham have something in common. Oh, is that what you Victoria? That? Yes. Did you see that clip? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was like, she, it was like yeah. Dave, she, she like tries to paint herself as growing up like working, working class. Working class. And okay. David Beckham's like, tell the truth. And she's like, what? He said, what car did your father drive you to school in? And oh, she'd wow. be like, Rolls Royce. He's like, thank you. And then slams the door. Oh, I had no idea. That's Fantastic so clip. So we are. So, 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 but. But my father eventually lost all of his money in bad real estate investments. So he ended up, by the time he passed away, he'd lost all of his money. Really? Yeah, yeah. But now, you, and you were so okay. So you you moved for two weeks. Do you remember the protests when you were a kid? All I remember as a kid was so going back to Iran in the in the seventies. It was actually interesting. So we had so much Western influence. Like I had all these comic books, Spider Man, you know, Superman, all that stuff. And I remember I had a cousin. We would read. We 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 look at the comic books and we try to re-en- reenact all the bubbles. You know, um, I went and saw the mo- first movie I remember seeing was Rocky. It come to America, uh-huh. come to Iran. And the side note: forty five years later, just like last year, I'm at the Laugh Factory, and one of the comics happens to be dating Sylvester Stallone's daughter. <laughs> So I walk in, this guy, Mark Hayes, is an Irish guy. I walk in, he goes, hey, Sly is here tonight. And I go, what? He goes, yeah, Sly. I go, Sylvester Stallone, why is he? He goes, I'm dating his daughter. I go, great. So then I go on stage, and I do my set, and it goes well. And he's sitting in the front. They got the whole section with his, uh, I don't know if it is his ex-wife now, Jennifer. They have a whole show. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. They, so she was, so they're all sitting there in the front and, and, and a booth. And I have a good set, and I come off, and as I'm walking by, I go, "Let me, I'm gonna try and say hi." So I say hi to her, and she pokes him because someone was talking to him at that point. She's like, "Hey, it's the guy from stage," and he goes, "Hey," and then I lean in, and I go, "Can I just tell you real quickly?" I go, "You know, your movie was the first movie I ever saw 45 years ago in Iran," and he goes, "Oh, really?" And I go, yeah. And he goes, Ugh. and then I walked away. And that was it. <laughs> yes. You know, he must be. He must get that all the time. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, you had yeah. a deep cultural like, impact. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so yeah. So 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 then. Um, so so the the culture. So I, so the culture was that culture, and I and uh, you know very westernized. And then I come to America, and I'm like. You know, we my dad was rich, so we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria, no, the Plaza Hotel mm. across the street from F. A. O. In New York, in New York. This is yeah. what my dad, my dad liked to live it up in in New York. He he had highs and lows of money, yeah. But he would come to New York. We would stay at the Plaza, there you have or the it. Waldorf, yeah. And F. A. O. Schwartz. Someone recently, he was a single dad, a uh, divorced parents, and like someone mentioned that. F. A. Schwartz is like a good spot for single dads because they bring you there. It's the do you know F. A. Have you been there when it was like in its prime? F. A. O. Shut up! I don't know. I'm I don't older know. Than you. <laughs> but I don't. But yeah, I don't know. But like, Hilarious. like I just remember like. How dare I, I, have, have we, uh, When did you move to New York? I'm from New Jersey. Okay, well, so there you have it. There you have it. Well, you know what? But, but like the, the, that's where my dad. I mean, it had the big clock, and it was it was oh a wonderland God. as a kid. It was it was it was where Toy Story still felt. Magical and not fully commercialized. Yeah, big. Do you know an actor named Tom Hanks? <laughs> he did exactly. a movie. Yeah. Dun, da, 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 da. <laughs> well, the good news is you do look a lot younger than your age. And the that's, truth that's is, what it was, like. and the truth is, I actually ran the, the first time I ran into this was I was at the factory years ago doing some bit, mentioned Marlon Brando, saw the blank expression on this guy's face, 
And I go, Marlon Brando? And he goes, no. I go, you don't know? I go, The Godfather? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I go, you know, and I go, that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was trying to, I tried to replicate that a few times in front of other people of my age or like 10 years younger. And I would be like, you know, a lot of people that are younger don't know Marlon Brando. I go, watch. And I'd like be in front, you know, I was doing a, some talk at a college and the professor was my age. I go, how many of you guys know Marlon Brando? Not a hand goes up. And her jaw dropped. So then I was talking to these 20 something year olds in Florida and I was like, yeah, you know, this thing with Marlon Brando. Do you guys know Marlon Brando? They go, no. I go, remember Godfather that he talks like this to come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding? And she goes, oh, the raccoon in Zootopia. Yes, yes the babies. That's listen. how they know him now. Black people are obsessed with the mafia, so yeah. we know. I mean, all the Godfathers have many opinions. That, really, that's that's. Oh yeah, you never see Cribs. What I always like. No, I haven't I got, seen Cribs. I got the copy of the Godfather. I got oh. a copy of you know they. All, what do you think it is? What is it about the? I think it's it's that American dream thing. It's the America the the falsehood of the American yeah, yeah, dream. Yeah, you yeah. can come here, yeah. you know. But he my, was already rich. My dad's rich. like a little Italian, and yeah. he he would say he'd say stuff to me seriously as a kid. He'd go, he go, son, don't ever get in bed with the mafia. Hilarious. As <laughs> if I've ever had an opportunity. <laughs> he would come close. <laughs> he used to say to me, he said, son, you, you like, if you, someone ever really messes you, you, let you let me know, and I'll take care of it. And I look back, and I'm like, were you telling me that you we could murder, murder someone? someone? Yeah, yeah. And no, you can't. Yeah. Break his legs. And yeah. then, no, you can't. He yeah. couldn't do anything for yeah. me. Yeah. But he really he really believed it. He probably knew someone kind of. Like, son, g- you, you need to go dump all that heroin you have in your, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in your room, yeah, son. Your pack mule. Yeah, I guess you think you know someone. I mean, you probably, like, listen, ultimately, there's somebody in your family in the, like, yeah, my my great grandpa Luigi, he dealt with the boxing, but like I couldn't, I couldn't get a favor done yeah, for me. Yeah, it's yeah. true. My great grandpa Luigi, he was a manager for like boxers, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. opera stars, and probably crooked, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have cousins uh, from the projects in Brooklyn that would probably murder, but they're like they're, <laughs> they're better now. And so what happened was like all the crime during the nineties. Now they all live in like South Carolina because <laughs> yeah, yeah, they yeah. have to flee New York. Yeah. So maybe they won't murder now, but. In the late nineties, early two thousands, it paid right. Could have got something done. And how long were you in New York before you moved from? We were in New York only for a couple months because it was late seventy. It was it was one of the coldest winters in New York history. And so my mom was because we were looking for a place to stay and we're looking for homes. And my mom told my dad, "Is like we we got to get out of here." So we went first to Reno. He had a friend in Reno, and my dad was a big gambler. So everywhere we'd go, we go stay at the casino, and he had a lot of money. So every time I'd like be walking around my mom would be like oh your dad met the owner he may buy into this casino like he was gonna buy into MGM and Reno were they fun they sound uh, like what what was your dad like my dad was larger than life he was like uh, you know life of the party great dad always you know know, big tipper listen my dad my friend was just telling me he goes I remember um, your because I just I just was with my son and I had like a hundred dollar bill and I gave him a hundred dollar bill to go get something and I was with my friend from my childhood and my friend goes Dude, I just remember the first time I ever saw a hundred dollar bill was your dad pulling it out back in the day. Nice. Wow. And he would give us like hundreds. Nice. That's yeah. my dad too. Yeah. My dad was like my that dad's too. hundred. Yeah. And he when I turned eighteen, he gave me a hundred, sent me to a strip club. He said, Go to a strip club. Yeah. That's and then, then I got there, it was like a hundred's not enough yeah. to yeah, 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 My yeah. dad also died yeah. penniless yeah. <laughs> and lost all my, his my money. My dad is about too soon, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. That's one thing, one thing, my dad that I learned later in life that he taught me was so. So as he was getting sick, and and, and he came, he was living in Iran, and he came to visit us when I was. Um, I don't think I'd married my wife yet, but whatever it was, I I told my wife, I go, we're gonna we're gonna take my dad out to dinner because I'd done a comedy show and they gave me a coupon to a nice restaurant. I was like, all right, let's go use this coupon. Yeah, take my dad, and we went to sit. And as we're sitting, the maitre d was sit, sitting sitting us. My dad gave the maitre d a tip, and I go, what are you doing? I go, you gotta wait till after. To you know, see how the service was, and he goes, "What's the point of tipping them after? Like they're not going to take care of you if you point tip them after." No, that's right, Pop. I was like, "Oh shit, you're right." Yes, you, know you got to slip a little something okay. as you sit, as you sit. Papa Jabroni, let yeah. me find. That makes so much. sense. I never would have thought of that because I was a take, server for years. Yeah. If somebody had tipped me in the beginning of the meal, they're going to take care. Of you, and, yes. then, and they'll tip you at the end, and yeah. you're going to take care of them. Yes. Was it when he got older and started getting broke? Where you're like, "Hey, Dad." Yeah, take Chill it out. Easy. No, that was Starbucks. Like, Give me a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was his thing, though. I mean, I think I think the key is to like always be, you know, I guess have it, be ready to tip, and because ultimately that's that that says that that talks louder than 
anything else. What's the tip in the beginning? I think that family of four. Yeah, I think no. At that restaurant, I think you either give them ten or twenty. It wasn't that yeah. much. Okay. It was just I like I mean, that's still because yeah. because you get a tip on the back. That's very classy. Yeah, you still, you still give, you still give them your twenty percent at the end, but at the beginning, you slip them a twenty dollar bill. You're good to go. Yes. You know and I've I've done that. I don't do that as much as I should, but I've done that before. And like all of a sudden, your table looks a lot. Not, it's a much better section. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. it, and 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 it's just walking in and playing the thing and oh hey how are you? good to see you you know. It, and it so feels good. It feels good. I love it. I did that. I was so and you guys know like sometimes like your the way your fans see you is bigger than your pocketbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in the movie Friday After Next, uh-huh. which was a big hit, and I was a main character in it, and and so but I only made you know I I was a, it was the first big movie I did so. I made like sixteen thousand dollars. Did it two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, got residuals and stuff. But after I filmed for two weeks, I went back to being a receptionist. Like I was yeah. back to be. But somewhere around that time, I went to Las Vegas to watch a friend of mine in a comedy show, and it was um, it was this big show they were doing. Um, uh, I forget what it was called. It was something something circus. Like there was acrobats. There was all kinds of stuff. And we go there and it's chaos trying to get into this club. And I'm there with my with my wife, and. We're trying to get in, trying to get in, and the security guard sees me, and he goes, Moly, from Friday. I go, yeah. He's like, oh, hey, and he calls his superior supervisor. Hey, this guy, this. So now this guy got me in, and at the time, I, you know, I was doing all right, but I wasn't doing great. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I probably had like, you know, $200 in 20s. One, I, yeah. Give him a 20? I, give him a 20? I, I gave him a 20. Then the next guy goes, hey, Moly. I gave him a 20. I'm, I'm, I'm tipping 20s. I'm like, oh, you're broke. Tipping your fans. Tipping, I love it. They yeah. still tell that story. Yeah. That's a good story. Yeah. Um, and you, when you moved to California? Yeah. You said you were bullied in in school. Yeah, it was the bullying was interesting because so so the hostage crisis happens, right? So it's similar to what like after September 11th, you know. I mean the the patriotism can blind people. That's why I never like I'm, I try not to say I'm proud to be American. I'm proud to be Iranian. I'm proud to be the. There's good and there's bad to all of it. I'm not but, a patriot. Yeah, but, but it, it, yeah. it'll blind you, right? Because you just take the side of the, and you go, yeah, you know, get them all. So, and they do it. They really. When I was in school, at least my school, we did the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, and I, it was always weird. I sat down for it. Really, they had to call my mother Good for you and say, "Yeah, I was. I was young too. I was like in elementary school." And she was like, "My daughter does not have to stand up for the uh-huh. Pledge of Allegiance." And was it fully because? Country? Was it fully at the time you were like, "This country has done great wrongs." I mean, I was like that. <laughs> I'd be in Sunday school, and my Sunday school teachers would be like, "If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell." And I'm like, "What about my Muslim friend? What about my Jewish friend?" And they were like, "They're going to hell." And I was like, "This doesn't make sense." Called my mom, told her. <laughs> Question at all? Well, she keeps messing up, so I was just poor always mom's that dropping kid. you off places. Gets yeah. a call ten minutes later. God she said, damn it! This girl. You know, it's, so. the, it's the whole thing of blind patriotism. You gotta love this country. Now the fact is, I appreciate this country. I think it's like sure. and I tell people, I go, if you think make America great again is needed, I go, you should go travel to other countries and see what a great country we have. We have a lot of problems, mm-hmm. sure, but we also have a lot of like a lot of great things. And I go, so you should appreciate what you do have. So I appreciate the country. But as you said, I appreciate it with its faults, and I will yeah. call out its faults. We can't sit here and be blind to our history. And be like, I don't want to see slavery because white kids are going to feel bad. White kids aren't going to feel bad. White kids are going to be like, wow, my grandfather was an asshole, right? Oh, for sure. I think it's, it's also the thing of like they think they can bully. America is so big. And I always think like the conservatives, when they, they think they're going to like teach history in a specific way, they're like, you're not going to get the whole country just to be like, okay. We'll all be patriotic now. Yeah. You cannot force patriotism in a place this big. Maybe in other places where you're you're fucking killing people and whatnot, you can enforce. But it's not going to happen in. And that's what they would do to us in school, where it was like they would do this pledge of allegiance, and I had a teacher whose son served and who's who was a military, you know, family. Yeah. And I remember some girl was like, just trying like pushing me during the pledge and and. She thought I wasn't respecting the pledge. Of she came over and she's like, "That those red is the blood of the soldiers," and like just really trying to like, I don't know, shame, shame me you. <laughs> into patriotism. And I'm like, "That's not that's not gonna work." Yeah. No. yeah. And the the way that they slip it into the sports things where it's just like, uh... "Oh, I was the early Colin Kaepernick." You yeah. Look at me. Well, it's you know it's the, that's I think. When they criticize Colin Kaepernick or they criticize anybody, I go, that's the whole point of this country. 
is that we can sure, is we should be that. able to do that without getting criticized. Mm-hmm. So so when the hostage crisis happened, there was a lot of anti-Iranian sentiment, and back then they would call you fucking Iranian. So I remember the sixth grader. That, that's the slur they just added fucking graders? in front of it. Yeah, yeah, fucking Iranian. So I was in the fourth. <laughs> And there was a sixth grader who you call you, who call you fucking Iranian. And then I had friends who got beaten up. And then when you talk to other people, they talk about like, you know, bricks to the windows, you know, getting death threats, all kinds of stuff. Because there was there was this. Because listen, if you want just uh, uh, and you left because you weren't so into that, so, the current system. So that shows you how patriotism can blind because. Mm-hmm. These people, rather than sitting there going like, oh, my God, you left this regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You came here. Maybe you don't agree with it. Yeah, you're on my side. No, they turn around and go, oh, you're fucking Iranian. Oh, and you're a friend of mine, Ahmed Ahmed, who was in the Axis of Evil. He's yeah. Egyptian. He goes, he goes, he used to get shit because of the Costas crisis. Yeah, he's so, like, I am Egyptian. <laughs> you know, even, yeah. So, so it just shows you how stupid and blind the patriotism makes you. And I'm fucking Egyptian. <laughs> fucking, I'm fucking Egyptian. Fucking Egyptian. Get it right. Um, but, but if you want an interesting thing, if you go um, on YouTube and put, I think, um, Iran hostage crisis nightline. So what had happened was um, uh, the, the Tonight Show numbers back then with Johnny Carson were crazy. It was like, I don't know, 30 million viewers a night or something or 20 million, a lot. Fallon's below a million, just to put it in perspective. Below a is. million? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So back then it was like 30, like half the country was watching him. And then so ABC was trying to compete. So ABC goes, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do uh, a, a, a show. We're going to call it, um, I think it was called America Held Hostage Iran, or America Held Hostage Iran Crisis or something like that. For some reason, I, I hear America, I think America's Got Talent. So in my mind, it was like <laughs> the best hostage, hostage takers. Yeah, yeah, hostage. Make hostage yeah. funny. <laughs> May they sing, you know. <laughs> yalla, yalla. <laughs> um, so, so they start their show, uh, and that show uh, starts bringing in numbers because people want to know what's going on with the hostage crisis because there wasn't 24-hour news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. News. So then eventually by like day one, and then they start counting the days. Day 142, and there's Ted Koppel was the guy. Yeah. Day 142, Iran hostage crisis. That's what created Nightline. At one point, they stopped calling it Iran hostage crisis. They call it, started calling it Nightline, uh-huh. and they would count the days. And so I went and watched one of those episodes, and there's this episode, and it's back then, it was like half an hour or maybe more. So he's like, you know, today we're, you know, we've got the family of one of the hostages. We're following them around in, in San Diego. So they follow the two kids and the mom. She's making breakfast. The kids are there. The, the dad's a hostage. The ki- they follow the kids to school. They ask the mom questions. She's crying. And, and, then, and, then, and then they bring on the, the, the Iranian ambassador to the U.S., and they put him on half of the screen, and they put the mom on the other half, and they start talking to each other. And this guy, the Iranian guy, is defending what they're doing. And the so I'm sitting there watching this on YouTube, and I'm going, "Gosh, if I were some dumb American back then yeah. watching this, I too would want to go beat up some American the next day." Because I'm sorry, some Iranian, Iranian yeah. the next day, because I was like, "These motherfuckers are do." So that was the sentiment. So these guys, yeah. so so they would come to school and they would pick on you, or they would call you fucking Iranian, or they'd do whatever. Were your parents Have you talk- been in therapy, Maz? Because this sounds very no, I've so talked beautiful. About, I've talked about it a lot. He so said comedy is therapy. So yeah, it, is. it really is. It really, but, is. It really but, is. But like, did your did your parents like would would you talk with them about like, hey, this kid? There was none of that. Like, there was my parents. I think they were like, I don't think my ki- my parents never took us aside and said, listen, if anybody says like, I asked my mom, I go, what did you guys just say? What did you guys do back then? And my mom said, well, you know, my dad is from northern Iran, so that's. Uh, the border of like Russia and Turkey. Yeah. So they're Azerbaijani. They're Turkish. Yeah. So my mom said, "Listen, if your dad didn't want to deal with it, he he just say I'm Turkish, and Americans don't even know the difference about whatever." <laughs> right. So my dad was not the guy who was like, "Son, there's gonna be trouble." Like he, he was just like, yeah, yeah, "Make something up." <laughs> yeah. They live. I don't. You know. And I and I wasn't coming to back then. You wouldn't come and be like, "This happened." You just kind of you know you'd be like, "Oh, I guess this is part of life." I don't know. Yeah. Do you, you wish that? Like looking back, you're like, oh, I wish they talked to me about racism when I was a kid. Like, or like you, you had to process so much on your own of like, oh, this. W- were you able to be like back then, like, oh, this kid is an idiot? Well, I think. Listen, I think that like I was pretty good, and and my personality has always been like I was friends with the jocks, I was friends with the drama nerds, I was friends with everybody. And and early on, I remember like looking back on it therapy wise, I I would like I was pretty I was pretty good 
athlete, so that helped. Um, I used to watch all these cartoons, so I think I tried to be funny. Mm -hmm. And I used to bring a lot of candy to school and just hand it out to people. <laughs> so I learned how to bribe. I've been tipping people. Throwing from the, candy from the yeah, Rolls Royce. I've been Royce. tipping people from the beginning. <laughs> tipping people from the beginning. Yeah. That's um, you said that children talking about racism. Candy. Yeah. Candy. Yeah, everyone candy. You slip them a Starburst. I'm a fucking Aradia with candy. Be before you sit down for the meal, you give the guy a couple Starbursts. <laughs> you go, hey, that's for you. There's more of that if you, <laughs> you give me good service. So, So I think that... My personality helped me get through it. I have a friend of mine who was very combative and like used to get fight picked on and beat up all the time because he was just he kind of was a smart ass. So I think I probably learned watching him. I was like, all right, don't do that. Just kind of like put your head down, walk past. You yeah. know, um, I do. I in my stand up, I talked about like there was like you know growing up growing up in Marin, there there wasn't that much diversity. Mm -hmm. There was this one. I was in the fourth grade. There was one black kid in the fifth grade. And at one point, they stole the pedals off my bicycle. Now, I don't know if they did it because I was Iranian or because I had a nice bike. But I just remember, we're like walking. Yeah, they saw that Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce said, bikes. The dad will buy him some new <laughs> fucking yeah. pedals. Yeah. So I'm walking with my bike and we're like, no pedals. I'm walking to take it to the bike shop to, you know, maybe buy pedals. And I remember him kind of like talking talking to me and being nice and stuff. The black kid. The black kid. Yeah. And in my stand up, I go, I go, you know, there was one black kid. He put his arm around my shoulder. He's like, Let's, let's walk for a second. He goes, I've been dealing with this shit for 250 years. Let me tell you what you got to do. <laughs> um, candy. So, yeah, candy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, what, when you, because you left when you were so young, like, how do you, what's your relationship to Iran now? Like, do you stay up to date? <sighs> how it's, often do you go back? I don't go back. So, so I left 45, 46 years ago. 45 years ago? I was, I was six. I'm 50, 51 now. 45 years ago, I left. I've been back once. My father moved back. So he came to America, lost a lot of his money. He still had properties back in Iran. He went back to Iran to try and do some stuff with it and basically live, live the end of his life there. Uh, he Did actually, him and your mom separate? Pretty much. Like he left, he went over there. I had like a girlfriend. My mom basically, div you know, divorced and all that stuff. And, and she, um, but she was my mom. My mom stayed. My dad, and then my dad came back at the end of his life and actually passed away here. But by then he was he was he was like fifteen years older than her. She, they never. I always say my dad was a great father, but was not a great husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he came back here, did he stay with with her? No, he came back. He stayed with me a little bit. Stayed with my sister a little bit, and ultimately ended up in like a nursing facility because he just was so in such bad state. He needed somebody to yeah. watch him. And all. that girlfriend was gone. Whatever girlfriend, girlfriend was back there, you know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he. <laughs> I see um, him tipping people at the senior exactly. citizens' home. <laughs> so he. Um, so uh, uh, I went back once when he was there, um, and I was there for two weeks. And the people are beautiful. The hospitality is amazing. Like if you watch Anthony Bourdain did a uh, Parts Unknown in Iran, yeah. and he's someone who's traveled the world. And one of the lines he said that I really liked, he goes, you know, I traveled the whole world. He goes, I never thought that the most hospitable people would be in Iran. Mm. And they really are because I think it's part of our culture is to like make you feel home, here have every, you know, food, you know, whatever's mine is yours. It's, very, it's a very formal culture in that way. Um, and so it was great to see the people. It was amazing because I hadn't been there in like 20 years at that point. So it was amazing to walk into my aunt's home and smell a smell I hadn't smelled in 20 years and be right back to it. Like the really? food and the house. Yeah. And the, but at the same time, it was very sad because I saw that the opportunity for young people, there was no opportunity. That's why I go back to the whole Make America Great Again, right? There's people all over the world still mm -hmm. dying to come to America. And why was there no opportunity? You're saying it's so hospitable. It's so, but, but like the economy's is that not the great. the Ayatollah's it, well, doing? It, it's that, but also the economy. Listen, they've mismanaged the economy. The the kids go to college and, and schools and whatever, but like there's, you know, in America, there's colleges everywhere. There's, yeah. you know, if you don't make it into a university, you go to JC. If you don't make it to JC, you go to, this. there's all kinds yeah. of opportunities. If you really want it in America to like work and find something, it's there. Over there, it's just limited because like a lot of these places, their economy is even worse. Like inflation is crazy. You have a lot of people that get educated and then they don't have any work to do. And then, and then you have, then you got to sit there and look at like, I remember then I was only there for two weeks, but I was worried about like, oh, if I'm walking down the street with my sister, someone could come over and be like, are you guys, what's your relationship? You know, somebody could bother me. Morality police could stop me. And so is there, is there like 
police and morality or is morality police their police or is it like different divisions Second. like they have a cop and then do they, they wear I a think, costume i think it's a different thing so the morality police so what happened la- in last year's protest with this lady Massa yeah. gina amini she her hair was out of her hijab a little bit and the morality police showed up and they have like i think they have like the, the women for the morality police are fully covered and then they got a couple of like thugs with them and they'll show up and be like your hair is this that the other get in and then they're very abusive, and then not just cover it. Yeah, get uh, in the truck. Yeah, they, you know, they're, they, this is where we go back to what I say when I say like I I I warned people last year. I said, look, what you see in Iran, it, Iran is a cautionary tale. Because so I go, you think that a minority of people could not create an autocratic yeah. state, yeah, and make us live in this like Handmaid's Tale. But I'm here to tell you, they just took away your right to choose, and a majority of people want that right to choose. But it's no longer a right to choose. And there's these same people who then these same people try to instill uh, Donald Trump as a as a dictator because he lost the election, but he said I didn't lose the election. Yeah. And they still make excuses for it. Yeah. So all of that to say that you think, oh, America, no, we have all these you know safety nets ready to stop it. No, nope. well, they ain't working. Because this dude's still free. There's still a lot of people who still believe that he won the election, and they still want him to be the dictator, and they want to instill their morals on you. Anytime somebody tells you, God told me this, that, the other, that and means therefore my you way, have to. Yeah, it's, my way is right. I do think what's so interesting about Trump, though, compared to like a religious leader, where like with a religious leader, you have an old text that informs what the values are. But like Trump is such an interesting entity where it's like, he doesn't care. He's not a religious person. But you know, but, he's not like God. He has no opinion on abortion other than whatever might might serve. But you him can in the always moment. be born again. Sure. So okay. that's what they said. He's born again. There's a great where Trump was first running, and he's like on some Christian podcast, and like, "What's your favorite Bible verse?" And he's like. You, immediately, you you can tell he's he couldn't even name one uh, <laughs> a, a book, and then he goes, "Oh, it's 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 hard to choose. I, I love them all." And like then they that. go, "Oh, but what's one you like?" And he's like, "I couldn't possibly." And you're, uh-huh. it's such a crazy. Uh, he's like one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> like it's it's and obviously with religions, it's it's worked in this dictatorship way before but it's interesting when it's devoid or or I will or it's say an this. amalgamation of evangelicals and just people who want patriarchy strong i mean it's i i will say a couple of things i've been reading this book under the banner of heaven have you guys read this i've heard of it john krakauer it's a great book i only read it because i was in salt lake city utah and my friends were like you should read this because i had questions about mormonism mm. and it just talks about mormonism and joseph smith and he has this like a you know god talks to him and says oh uh you should bang a lot of women you should have a lot of wives he's like that's that's gonna be yeah. in there yeah yeah and then and then and then and then now they all have these they all have uh. these they all have these uh, epiphanies or not epiphanies but like they talk to god and god tells them things that somehow are always very fortunate for them for them <laughs> it's very never, convenient you know, it's never like you should go you know uh run 50 miles up a hill and god then, said no more blowjobs uh, yeah yeah that's what he said god damn it no bacon no such thing so i'm reading this and how some of these guys commit uh, uh, acts of uh, um, criminal acts and acts of violence, and they get away with it because their followers just go, "Okay, if that's what you, if this is really what it is, and you're saying it, oh God, okay, then we're going to follow it." So I'm re- watching that, I'm reading that, and I'm looking at what televangelists do, which is like, "Give me all your money," because they're they're criticizing me because they're criticizing you, and I'm sitting there going, "Trump, whether consciously or subconsciously, wa- has seen." these religious you know leaders yeah. do this and he's basically taken a page out of that book and he said I'll do whatever you need me to do and that's why the evangelicals love him so you're right he he himself yeah. doesn't know anything but the evangelicals have t- turned and twisted their bodies to be able to say this lying cheating scoundrel who's like not religious who's just like the most un- the most unjesus person in the yeah, world who's definitely was paid for sent by god <laughs> that's the thing that I think I didn't know until Trump of like that 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 kind of pretzeling could happen. Oh yeah, so extremely. I, but I knew, and but I knew it being in Sunday school and having sure. to go to church, and I was just like, "You guys are blindly following this, but it doesn't make sense. Like it's what you're trying to tell me doesn't make sense. I'm asking questions, you cannot answer them. No answers. You know, so I, I, my intellectual brain rejected it. I was like, yeah. this doesn't. So I I kind of feel like if you're not a critical thinker. 
Yeah, and it's and you know, and they don't want you to be. So again, in Mormonism, they want you, you to say be. a lot of times these women who are in these, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, these polygamous marriages have been told don't question. Yeah. So the fact that you read child when, brides. Yeah. When you're reading it, you go. So the guy marries this woman, and then the woman has a daughter. So then he goes ahead and basically rapes the twelve year old daughter. And then has a kid with her, and then another, and on and on and on and on. And I was just reading right now, like there's so much. Like there was this one girl who's like, her, she was raped by her dad, and then she escaped, but then she's got four or five other sisters, and she's like, I'm afraid the guy's just raping them. And the guy keeps having these, the, he keeps saying, God is talking. I am Jesus. Mm-hmm. So okay, that guy should not be walking around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but there's but the people that he's with, and there's others who respect him, have been told to not question. Don't question. Yeah, do not ask questions. And that's the problem. When you don't question, you end up in this situation where you go, well, you go like, how could anybody support the Islamic regime that is brutalizing their own people, throwing innocent people in jail, killing innocent kids, all this other stuff? How can anyone support them? Well, because there's a portion of the population who thinks this dude who is now the chosen guy, he's got some... You know, ordainment. Yeah, yeah. He's got some connection to God. He's got a phone that goes to God that the rest of us don't have. But that's why those pictures. Oh. I, they always show that pictures from Iran. They they'll yeah, always show the one. the early f- show photos of Iran and just to sh- it's it's wild to think how swiftly the idea of getting just women to just put on something over their head and it's like it's enforced. How I, I'm curious, like how fast. Well, dude, think about this. Like, I mean, if you uh, you know, I I. I watched a lot. I listened. I read a lot about like all the all the stuff of January sixth. If they had succeeded in taking over Congress, then what the part of the plan was they would take over Congress. Donald Trump could call a state of emergency, mm-hmm. um, and he could have the military come in. And then because now we're living under this uh, state of emergency, he could say, "Well, we can't really, you know, I can't leave yet. We got to keep this going." And eventually their their plan was like in the long term they were going to instill him he was going to be there and now you've got this military who's saying well you know we've got to live under almost like a military dictatorship for a while so if the people with the guns yeah. even if there's they're fewer than us but they can show up and say if you want to walk through these streets you have to cover your hair eventually there's going to be some people who are going to be like just cover your hair Let's yeah. figure it out. Just comply, you know, yeah. Just and that's the problem right now in Iran is that these people that protest that want their, like I think a majority of people are young. Uh, there's a lot of people who want their freedoms, but they have zero weapons, so they go out in the streets and they protest. And then the Islamic regime brings their thugs out with weapons, and they basically kill enough or imprison a lot enough where it dies down again. So and I don't know what the solution is because you feel do you do you like watch it and feel emotion do you go is it too much is it well it goes back to what so what you were saying so i have spent most of my life in america yeah for all intents and purposes i'm american but i also have a big iranian following i have a big iranian fan base i have obviously my family i have friends um culturally there's that tie and i think as a i think as a as a community as a diaspora we are traumatized by what had happened and it's somewhere deep inside so last year when the protests happened People were so like all over the world. People were pro. It was the biggest protest I yeah. think, and and people were angry. And then the, and then the problem became people started fight infighting. So all of a sudden, like I'm a very left leaning person when it comes to my politics. But the people that were on the right, there were like a lot of Iranians were pro Trump, and they thought Trump was going to somehow get rid of this regime, which mm. you know he killed the general within the protesting. The people protesting, like the morality pr- police, some of them were pro Trump. Yeah, so what would happen is, like, so you'd go to protest in Los Angeles. Like, I went to a protest in Los Angeles. You have uh-huh. Democrats, you have Republicans, you have everything. I don't care who you are. Sure. We're all protesting this ob- oppressive regime in Iran. We all agree. Well, whenever there's a conflict overseas, it's very interesting how the Republican-Democrat, like, suddenly they're they're together for a yeah. moment. For it's a moment. A, for a moment. But what happens is, so you're, so we're all, so I'm like, we all agree that this regime's oppressive. But then I'm at the I'm at the protest and some like lady my mom's age, she clearly I, I, mean, I guess they know my politics because I I criticize Trump a lot so she'll say so she saw me and she goes you filthy Democrat like she gave yeah. me, and I was like what the fuck and I wanted to be like bitch I go if the Democrats don't show up you're gonna lose half your protesters here right and yeah. I go by the way I go let's first let's first get rid of these guys. Then let's have our own. Then let's have a vote, and have, who, I don't care if you have a right wing, you know, government, left wing government. If you have a democratic like the government that's going to let people be free, 
then fine. But yeah. the problem becomes there's so much trauma that everyone just starts going at each other. And so I, for all intents and purposes, am American, but there's still the Iranianness in me somewhere. So, and then the thing that comes about is like there's a handful of Iranian American comedians, and like we were all kind of talking about how like we had to be vocal, we had to be like, do we do our shows? Do we not do our shows? And we said we should do our shows because it'll give us a chance to talk to our American audience and inform them about what's going on. And by the way, it's my job. I should continue to work. Yeah, there, there's yeah. there is that thing. It's like like when they're like, uh, especially with like Instagram, when they're like, no more jokes or whatever. I'm like, I still, I'm, this is my day to day. I'm sorry, I'm a I comedian. Understand. Did you not go to work today? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Shut up. <laughs> exactly. So with that, so... So sometimes I was saying I was like sometimes sometimes I wish I, I just wish I were Swedish or or like I don't, I don't know if you guys know who Ismo is Ismo is fin- from Finland. Oh yeah yeah yeah. I'm like if I were Ismo like I don't think Ismo ever has to deal with <laughs> crazy. Ismo yeah, never yeah. has to post a flag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Norway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean um, I do wish sometimes too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, I was, let's let's go on to our our next segment. This has got to stop. This has got to stop. Do you ever this has got to stop something that's it's big, small, personal. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, it, we were in politics. I stick with politics. What's got to stop is politicians who clearly have done some guilty shit, just coming out bald, bald faced, lying. This whole thing, like the twenty three indictments, just came down against George, George Santos. Santos. <laughs> Santos, and he was like, he's a fascinating human. By the way. I mean, clearly, like he was taking the credit cards of some of his donors and double, uh, double charging, and then going off and like buying stuff, and him. Uh, Bob Menendez from the Democratic side, and Jersey, then, Shout Jersey, out to New Jersey, and then, the gold bars, the and then, yeah, the yep. gold bars. Uh-huh. I mean, it's so obvious. Sure, I mean, I, I'm so I can't help but feel just such extreme pessimism in terms of like scam artists. Uh, you know, they they get in anywhere they can, yeah. and like clearly the political system has created a way that you could be insane scam artist. I mean, George Santos, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah. And this is, he's able to survive here for now. You know, will he go to jail? Will he have some punishment? Will he get off scot-free? But I'm like, I don't see that going away at all. I just feel like it's going to get worse and worse. I I don't know. I don't, I have no optimism in my heart about America getting better. It's just like, if someone came to you and said, listen, you know that joke you do, someone else is doing that joke. Like, I think that we have, there's still like, there's certain occupations where there's some honor where you go oh okay either you go well i'm you know i didn't i never saw it i'm doing it my my different way or you go oh my god you know what i'm gonna step away you know i'm not i don't want to be a joke stealer yeah i had i had that happen to me recently where it like there's another comedian that has a bit but the bit actually happened to me so i'm telling the bit i'm telling a story of something that happened to me and they're like this person has that bit and i was like no one called him fat though Right. Sure. Like someone actually called me sure. fat. So I'm like, you're just telling, you're just doing a joke. Yeah. I'm telling a personal story. So I'm like, if it, if it was a different, if it was an observation on an airplane or something, yeah, I'm going to give it away. But if it's a personal story I'm telling, I didn't steal your uh, joke. There's one that it shocked me so much. So it was uh, a comedy club in Denver. And I did, and there, I, there was an opener on it. I didn't watch the opener. Yeah. Like, it was no offense to the, I just, I was working I on my set. I can't watch the opener. But, but so I, I did a joke and it was about, uh, when I did one of the marches in Harlem, and then they started shouting "fire, fire, gentrifier," and I was in the march yeah. talking <laughs> about me. And this comic, who was a black comic in Denver, wrote on the video like, "You saw me do this joke. You stole this." And there was a moment where I was like, <laughs> "We could not have had quite the exact same experience." There's no way. And like, thank God, he and he wrote a long screed about about you know you you watched me in Denver. This is the exact joke, exact turns. And thank God I found a recording the day before Denver, if not further, where I was doing that joke. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But but I don't think there's honor. Mitt Romney, uh, there was that f- video where he confronted George Santos on the floor. And he said to George Santos, you don't belong here. Yeah. And, and if, <laughs> oh, to me, but it was, he does. It was such a classic of like, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you he talking about? Absolutely does. And this shit happened under your watch. Yeah, no and honor like, among thieves. None. None whatsoever. So, I'm like, yeah. he's just taking it to a cartoonish extreme. And I just can't wait to see the documentary and the Lifetime movie. Yeah, Guess what? Guess what? He'll produce it and he'll absolutely. get all the proceeds oh, yeah. from it. And he deserves it. son of a bitch. Yeah. 
<laughs> that fire it. festival guy, he's yeah. bringing back fire festival too. Nothing matters anymore. There's I no consequences scammers. to anything. I love the scammers. Tinder swindlers doing cameos. Absolutely, I stand a scammer. Listen to me. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, uh, did you ever this has got to stop? I do, oh, I do. Please. Um, the amount of weed in New York right now has to stop. It's oh stressing my me God. out. Uh, you could go to a bodega and buy a pre-roll. I don't even think it's weed. I think it might be Delta A. I'm trying to quit that's smoking, the thing. and I feel like it's making me whatever it is is like addictive too. So y'all gotta stop. Come on, New York, crack down on these people. That these is these aren't gonna to last. There's pre-rolls. there's fucking one on every block. Every and it's so funny to think about every block. when I I remember when Weeds was on Showtime and it was like. Oh, dispensary would be the coolest thing in the world. And now I see empty dispensary after uh, empty dispensary selling the exact same products, no difference between None. them, all the same kind of like we're cool, zazaz, or just like yeah. just like cool hip. It's, it's all going to collapse. They're all going to fucking close. Yeah, all of our lungs are going to collapse and as guess well. guess what? I still get my weed in L.A. because there's something in me is like I, I, I doubt Tova really thinks it's all the Delta 8 yeah. shit. At the bodegas, for sure. Yes. <laughs> At the bodega, if I got to show ID to get in, that's weed. Yeah. If I just walk into a bodega and say, yeah. "Give me a chopped cheese yeah. and a pre roll," yeah, that is Too probably easy. Delta Eight. So my, this has got to stop. Uh, my my girlfriend, she's been trying a CPAP machine, not oh. going great for you. Not going great. Uh, yeah, is but it also loud. No, I mean no, because it's it's a suction thing, but it's 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 big. I mean. Mm-hmm. It's, it's for, her, well, you she had, you, she, for her, she's she has to... night terrors and oh, okay. and sleep apnea. She did a sleep study, okay, and so it, it would it would certainly help me, but it would also help her too. But uh, she's really struggling with it. Wakes up an hour in. It's huge. It's mad. Uh, yeah, jeez. And her insurance gets the data from the snoring machine. Get this: if she doesn't use it four hours a night on average. For seventy percent of the nights, she then has to pay for it in full. What they have, they get the data from the machine, and if she doesn't use it according to their system, then she will then have to pay a very expensive, for a very expensive. So, then, so then, do you put it on for two hours? Well, that's what I, I asked. You just I said, run it. I said, could we run it? And she she seemed to say no. We're, we're still looking into it. Maybe but you got a, you got a pet. Uh, yeah, we'll get <laughs> yeah, a pet just for that. Animal. <laughs> yeah. Put it on him. But the most big brother fucked up health insurance shit. And oh, so now the worst. my girlfriend with that's the night the with the night tears and the sleep apnea now is paranoid that if she takes it off, she's gonna owe money in the middle of the night. They're the worst. The, and, and this our our whole medical system is also screwed. But it's like the fact that like right now, after all these years, the Biden administration has finally been able to just get the right to negotiate. For the medical, for the uh, Medicare drug prices to come down, doesn't mean the prices are going to come down. No. No. They They're finally got the right, so that should just show you yeah. how. And also, I got breathing trouble. I can get a pre-roll easier than I can get an inhaler. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. need both. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to our final segment here. You better count your blessing. You better count your blessing. We've been negative. Let's say one thing that we're we're grateful for. Joyelle, do you have something? I'm going to say it since you've been talking about her this whole time. I'm very grateful for my manager, and I'm gl- grateful that she has a CPAP machine because I need her to stay alive because we're getting money together, baby. Uh, so uh, love you, Tova. Grateful for her. I think she the CPAP found is me. keeping her alive. The CPAP is keeping me alive being able to sleep <laughs> before I go to fucking Arizona <laughs> to perform for eight people at the House of Comedy. Uh, 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 this, by the way, this is uh, this is coming out. Oh, well, we'll do plugs after this. Um, uh, I'll go, uh, oh God, I don't even know how to, I don't even is know how to Is that clear this. to get into the No, that, that was a, this has got to stop. I'm not thankful for clear. Uh, I'm not thankful for the person who's, who's been hired to highlight to, I could do it. I'm going to bring my own fucking highlighter. Do you have clear? Uh, of course. We got Double it. Double entry, yeah. clear. We got it. There's going to be, I know, I know clear in a year plus. there's going to be a new thing. There's going to be a third thing and we're all going to have to fucking have sign a clear up for clearer. it. It'll be clearer. Yeah. Clear plus? I, I, they have What's clear that? plus now. I don't know what it is. I just saw it last time I was oh at the God. airport. Son of a bitch. Um, so uh, I'll put it like like this. So I I I, I worked for a very long time uh, uh, with a touring agent named Matt Bourne, and uh, uh, we're not working together anymore. But he was uh, an incredible, incredible agent. Worked with me when he was giving me hosting gigs at Bananas, and. Uh, 
just a, a f- one of the best things that ever happened in my whole little career, all the way back starting as an actor, and I'm just so grateful for what, what an incredible agent he is, and anyone would be lucky to work with him. Is he That's nice. here? He's yeah. no. I just wanted to say it. I just wanted what to. I just uh, yeah. I just want to share it. That's my blessing. I just want to. Okay. I just want to. Ca- I just want to thank that casting director that did not cast me. <laughs> However, I'm still available. Great Best cool. casting director ever. Uh, no, I'm gonna go with my son. He's 15, and I love my Aww. daughter too. Of course, she's 12. But my son has kind of come out of that early teens. Ugh. And yeah. he's done the worst some, age, middle, yeah, and middle had, school. And he's had moments that like really made me proud. He's he started surfing. We live in mid mid Los, midtown Los Angeles, and so he started surfing in Santa Monica, which is about a, like a half hour like car ride. And uh, I was gonna go see his friend to go surfing. I said, oh, "I'll get you an Uber." He goes, "No, no, I'll take the bus." I go, "What do you mean take the bus?" He goes, "Yeah, I take the bus." And he's been taking the bus on his own. Gets up. He's teaching me about the bus. Right in LA, that's a big deal. It's a y'all. big deal. And 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 he gets up early and he goes. And I was like, "Holy shit, this kid's a better person than I am." Aww. So I'm proud of him for that. And and I get to play. I've been I've been getting a chance to play soccer with him, which as my uh, all my joints and everything are going out of order. Yeah. I, I'm getting maybe a couple years to play with him, and and it's just been great. Oh, I love. Are you still that. better than him at soccer? Oh no, he's much better than me. I'm so. By the way, his name's Dara. Um, I I I kind of coach him on the field, and I asked him the other day. I go, "Would you get upset when I coach you?" He's like, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, it's funny because you're coaching me," and he's like, "And you're heading the ball into our own goal." And I was like, "I go, drag listen, buddy. him." I go, <laughs> "Come on, Dara, drag him." Yeah, I go, "I'm, I'm, I'm older. I go, I'm this old. I go, I go. If I survive the game, I'm happy. I go, you got potential. So yeah. I go, if you don't want me to coach, just let me know because I, I said something like, "Dara, you know, 50 percent of the time you're doing well. The other 50 percent, he's quoting me. They tell me that a lot of times, both the kids, they say, and my nephew, they say, you always, you always say in life, and whenever you talk to us, you're like in life." They're making fun of me. I'm like, all right, you bastards. I'll stop talking. <laughs> um, so this is coming out October 31st. What do you want to plug? Oh, wow. I'm on tour all over the place. After October 31st, I'm going to be in Connecticut. I'm going to be in D.C. I'm going to be in Atlanta, L.A. Go to mazjobrani.com, M-A-Z-J-O-B-R-A-N-I.com. I'm probably coming to your city. I'm going to be coming to New York in the new year, Boston, uh, doing a theater tour. And at Maz Jobrani all across the social media platforms. Amazing. Joyelle. Uh, yeah, uh, November 2nd through the 24th, I will be on tour in all of Canada with Roy Wood Jr., Arthur Simeon, and Malik Alassel. And yeah, we're going to like every city in Canada. So remote cities in Canada, look us up for the JFL tour. It's going to be on my link tree on Instagram, Joyelle Nicole, that my manager made for me, that my manager's boyfriend was hating on because he was like, why are you making this for her? And I was like, mind your business. Uh, mind your business. I say, I say, Tova, do you want to go on a date? I'd love to take you out. She says, I have to work on Joyelle's link tree. <laughs> I'm setting up the ticket sales for the Canada tour. Hilarious. Uh, that's gonna be such a cool. I can't. You're gonna wait. like know Canada in a way that most Canadians. Most Canadians won't even know. though, we we go into MBs and NSs and <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Owens. For me, I am uh, 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 tonight when this comes out. I will be flying to Milan. Uh, November 1st, London, November 2nd through... Most of these are sold out. I don't give a fuck. Maybe Paris, November 9th. So now you're just flexing. Got it. November 9th, I'm at Paris. There's a big theater. And do not bring those bed bugs. I talked to someone in Paris. They said it's overblown. It's not that bad. Are you doing doing the Apollo? I am. That's a great place. Yeah, great place. Yeah. And, uh, uh, And then the weekend after that, I'll be at the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut, November 16th through that Sunday, because I can do six shows there, I'm sure. Booked and busy. Um, uh, and, and, you know, just, just remember, progress is not guaranteed. This is the downside. One, two, three. Downside. downside. You're listening to The Downside. The Downside. With John Marco Cerezi. Tell him, Russell. Subscribe to The Downside right now. Where? Down here. Or here. We don't know, but just do it. Or also, what else could they do? They could follow the Patreon. They could subscribe to the Patreon. Ah, no! Patreon.com. Super pressure.